Hey, everybody. Um, had to go back and start a new video. I'm going to post about it on our page. Uh, sorry about that. You know, technology is great when it works. And I've been messing with this for the past 15 minutes trying to get it to, to work. It worked great for me the other day while I was uh, trying to get all the kinks worked out. But we're, uh, we're working through it. I uh, was starting a few minutes late, but again, sorry for the technical difficulties. We have around, uh, I think, 10 or 12 questions, and I want to thank those of you who submitted your questions. I enjoyed studying them and hopefully coming up with some kind of answer that, uh, that will be satisfactory. I want you to think about this, though. Those of you who are in the Murfreesboro area and who are uh, around this particular area, as uh, COVID-19 has kept us from doing a couple of things. I was wondering, and now that we're starting to get back to a little sense of normal, and now that things are starting to come back the way they are, rather than do it on the computer and rather than do it through Facebook, because I can't see you, uh, I hope and trust that you can see me and can hear me. Um, I, I, if you can't, I hope that someone will uh, comment and let me know. But uh, what do you think about doing a coffee with Coffee in Christ, where we come to the Salem Creek building? I'll have coffee here for us, and it'll be good coffee, I promise, and uh, we can kind of sit together and we can have more of an open forum discussion. Uh, it can be, uh, you can submit questions there uh, live from the floor, uh, and you can even be one of the ones who answers the question. If someone submits a question and you have a thought about that, you could potentially be the one to answer that question. So uh, I, I think that's something that would be beneficial for us to do. I think it would be uh, interesting for us to do. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started with these questions. Maybe we'll have more people come in. And, and if we don't, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that I can get this video put up on our Coffee in Christ YouTube channel so people can go back and, uh, and listen to it there and watch it. So here's the first question. I actually got this question just a little while ago uh, on my email about 30 minutes ago. I just checked it one more time, and this question popped up. Uh, by the way, all questioners and uh, identities of such will be left anonymous, so uh, don't ask. Here's the first question. Uh, the questioner says, I'm thinking about being a preacher. Good for you. Uh, what advice would you give a young preacher just starting out? Well, I am a young preacher just starting out. I'm in my fifth year of, uh, of ministry. I've been preaching for a long time. I've been preaching since I was nine years old. Um, but as far as working in the capacity, this is my fifth year at Salem Creek, and uh, I, I did part-time work before that, and of course, interning and things like that. But um, I would say, just by way of advice, because I'm in kind of the same boat you are, I'm a little further down the road, I guess, but uh, number one, get as much education as you can. If that's going to a school of preaching, if it's going to a university, if it's getting a master's degree, whatever, get all the education that you can. There are only two things that someone can't take from you, and that is your faith and your education. So get all the, of, the, of both as you, as you can. Uh, the second, though, is to not be so engaged in your education where you uh, puff up yourself, because that's something that preachers are very guilty of. You know, we, we get the degrees, and we have the knowledge, and we write the books, and we do the articles, and we preach the gospel meetings, and we start getting full of ourselves. So be careful about that. Um, Find a mentor who is willing to shape you into who you need to become. So I'm very lucky here. I work with Ron, and those of you who are at Salem Creek uh, know all, all of that. Um, Ron is my granddaddy in the faith. I love Ron. Uh, he, he has helped me in so many ways. He's, he's been in it for over 30 years, and... Uh, that's, that's been absolutely amazing to get to, to train under him, and that's what I consider this. Now, I don't consider myself a subordinate to Ron, and he doesn't consider uh, me in that way either or vice versa, but we're here to help each other, and, and he's willing to help me, and I desperately need that. So find someone who is going to, to groom you and to develop you into who you need to be uh, and, and who will do that without feeling threatened because sometimes preachers feel threatened by young, energetic preachers, um, don't let that happen. All right, uh, question number two then. 
a lot of the questions I got uh, revolve around the virus and social things that are happening now. And, and so I try to combine some of those together. Uh, here's, here's the question. Is the virus and uh, social unrest throughout the world signs of the end of the world? Well, in a way, yes and no. So the presence of a pandemic or a virus or something like that and the social unrest, social injustice, failing governments, I'm not so much going to say that they're signs of the end of the world so much as they're signs that the world is ending. Uh, we live in a fallen world. Genesis chapter uh, 3 tells us that we live in a fallen world. And not just humanity was fallen, but all of creation was fallen. And that's very uh, explicit in, in the curses that God gives, uh, not only to Adam and Eve and the serpent, but also to creation. And so things like pandemics and illness and, and uh, human pride, those are all results of a fallen world. So uh, I, want, I want to say, first of all, that these things are a sign that the world will end, the, this world will not last, but as far as are they signs that the, the end of the world is coming or that the Lord is coming back, uh, well, first of all, Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 says that no one knows the day or the hour, not even the Son, only the Father knows. And so we can't know when the day is coming. Uh, I, I, want to, I, I want to be careful how I say this because pandemics, historically speaking, have come and gone. You've had the Spanish flu, the Black Black Plague, Bonnet Plague, um, even the plagues that impacted Egypt. You know, that I would consider that a pandemic. So uh, those, those have come and gone. Regimes rise and fall. It's hard for us as Americans who have been a, a significant world power for a long time to realize that Rome eventually fell, Greece eventually fell, Egypt eventually fell, Mesopotamia, Babylon eventually fell. Uh, and it, it could happen, and I think we're kind of seeing that, that the fall of America is something that could happen. Uh, we're not exempt from that just because we are Americans. So uh, pandemics have come and gone, regimes rise and fall, uh, but that doesn't necessarily constitute the end of the world. So I think overall we need to just be aware that the world will end and that when the world ends, we need to be ready. So that's the whole point, be ready. Uh, number three, or, or number, yeah, number three, is live streaming or online worship right or wrong? Great question. With this time of quarantine and, and with the pandemic the way it is and us having to do things the way that we are, that's a big question that we're asking a lot. Um, is live streaming online worship right or wrong? Technology makes a great servant but a horrible master. And so what I mean by that is a lot of times what we do now, because technology is such a big part of our lives, even now we're live streaming. Uh, this isn't a worship service, but uh, we are live streaming. And what we do with that is we become a servant to it. You know, we, we wake up in the morning and, and even when we were in quarantine, this bothered me a, a lot when we were in quarantine and we were having to do YouTube sermons and YouTube worship services. People would say, man, I really like that because I can get up and not have to put on real clothes and I can go sit on the couch with a cup of coffee and I can just watch the sermon and, and that's my worship service. Well, if that's your worship service and you weren't worshiping at all. So technology is a great servant. It's a great tool. Right now, we're using it as a tool, but it's a horrible master. And so when we trade technology for coming together out of fear or blatant disregard for the Lord and others, we are sinning. Uh, so I we live stream here at Salem Creek. We live stream our worship services. And I think that that is incredibly important that we do because in the time that we live, we have people who for various reasons can't, they physically cannot come to worship service. But in that regard, they're not, uh, they're not forsaking anything. They, they would want to be here and we're allowing them an avenue to worship uh, as such. But when we say, well, I'm just not going to go today because it's convenient for me to turn it on the computer or turn it on TV and watch, then yes, that is sin because we have a blatant disrespect and disregard for the coming together of the saints. Hebrews 10.25 has been thrown around throughout this whole pandemic about um, not don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as is the manner of some, but all the more as you see the day approaching. And, and if you continue reading in that context, the the Hebrew author there says, 
that we are to meet together to build one another up, to edify one another. So when we come together, it's not just to worship the Lord. It's to build one another up. So God, in his plan for the church, has planned for us to be social and interactive people. And uh, we need to be doing that even in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, question number four, how do I start fasting? Great question. Uh, I would recommend getting a book by a guy named Joshua Houston called Should Christians Fast? Uh, I'm, I'm joking there, but it is a good book, and, and I, I would recommend it actually for this because uh, there's an appendix in there about how to start fasting. I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. Uh, you can find that book on Amazon. But uh, first of all, when you put in your mind that you're going to start fasting, don't mistake putting something away from your life that's convenient for biblical fasting. So we can say, okay, I'm going to go a whole day without getting on Facebook, or I'm going to go a, a whole week without chocolate. That's fine, but that's not biblical fasting. Biblical fasting is the removal of food from your life for an extended period of time so that you can use that time to meditate and pray and grow closer to God. Uh, some people would say that prayer is always coupled with fasting. That's not true. In Esther, the whole city of Susa fasts, and uh, there's no prayer mentioned there at all. So that's not entirely true for a biblical fast. But if you want to start... Uh, I would say, number one, keep it revolved around food. And number two, start slow and know your physical limitations. For me, uh, I'm hypoglycemic. I have to be very careful with, with uh, my fasting because when I fast, it usually hurts me uh, at the end of the day. I get dizzy. I get weak. I start shaking. Uh, but I'm fine after I've broken that fast. When I was writing my book, I fasted for three days. And at the end of the third day, I, I really thought I was going to die. I was so hungry, which tells you how spoiled I am as, an, as a middle-class American. But uh, start slow. Go skipping a meal once a day. But during that time, make sure that during that time you are using that for something God-honoring, that you're praying, that you're reading your Bible, that you're meditating, that you're uh, talking to your family members, you know, anything that you can do to replace that time. It's not so much about that you're going hungry, that you're trying to get God to see that you're hurting and hungry. It's that we're trying to take one thing out of our life and replace it with something godly. Uh, so make a conscious choice to do this and fill your time with something godly. Next question. Should a Christian be involved in politics? Should a Christian vote? How can a Christian support a candidate who is obviously immoral? Uh, well, today's voting day, so what a better time to ask this question than now. Uh, and this is a compilation of several questions, as you can tell. Uh, so should Christians be involved in politics? I would recommend that if you're struggling with this, if you're saying, you know, here we go, we got Biden and Trump probably. Uh, that's not entirely sure, but most likely we got Biden and Trump. And both of them are just horrible, you know, and, and what am I going to do? Who am I going to vote for? Should I even vote? Should I be involved in politics? Two resources that I think would, would do you well to look at. Number one is a book by David Lipscomb called On Civil Government. And remember, David Lipscomb is writing this book around the time of the Civil War. The nation is torn by politics and by government. And so that impacts a lot of what Lipscomb writes. But he's one extreme. Lipscomb believes that we shouldn't be involved in government at all, not even so much as to be involved with the Postal Service because they're the government. The other is this book called uh, God in Politics. It's written by a guy named Roy Heron, who was a state senator and a former mem uh, minister. He is not a member of the Churches of Christ, but uh, he is the other extreme. He's a lawyer, and he's the other extreme. So read those two, and then come to your own conclusion. Um, a couple of things about this. Remember that America is not the church, nor is the church uh, American politics and America is not the savior of the church or the leader of the church. So remember that. I think Americans, American Christians have forgotten that. Um, I think Christians, my, my personal opinion is that Christians should be involved in politics to a degree. I think you see that with Paul and Jesus. Jesus preached to Pilate, who was a governing official. Paul took the gospel to Caesar's household, uh, and Paul speaks to governing authorities all the time. So uh, I, I think we have a role in government I don't think we put our faith in government, but we put uh, we have a role in government. Also, uh, for those who are wondering, should I vote? Um, remember that we in America live in a republic. We do not live in a democracy. A democracy means a voice for all the people, uh, you know, one people, one voice. A republic says, I'm going to elect officials who are going to vote on my behalf. And so if that is the case, then we need to be electing officials 
who are going to vote the way that we would believe. So we, I believe we need to elect men and women who have the same moral code as we do. Now, the same moral code doesn't mean the same uh, religious beliefs or whatever, but you know, as close as we can get with the ones who are running. Uh, next question. This, this uh, sweet lady says, I've been sick for years. I've been unable to attend church services or do anything aside from stay in bed or at home. How can I serve God in my physical state? Uh, I love that you're thinking of this question. And uh, I would say, first of all, that love is the fundamental virtue of life. So because love is the fundamental virtue of life, everything that we do, uh, no matter whether we're uh, sick in bed or whether we're active and healthy, needs to be wrapped up in love. So the expression of love can come in many different forms. Maybe you have someone taking care of you. Uh, maybe you have the ability to write cards, to send notes, to, to text or send messages, whatever. You can be an encouragement to so many people. Um, I would say, however, that the, the one thing that came to my mind when I first read this question was you need to be willing to let other people serve you. One of the greatest ways you can serve God is to be willing to let other people serve you. Uh, Jesus commands us to serve one another. Paul commands us to serve one another. But what that means is we, we take that to say, okay, I need to serve someone. But that requires someone to serve. So for people who might be watching this who are in bed, who are sick, who are uh, in a poor physical state and can't get out and can't do those things that we've talked about. Let other people serve you. And don't feel bad about it. Don't feel bad about it. Don't take advantage of them, but don't feel bad about it. Okay, next question. This is a good question. There are several similarities between the Old Testament and ancient Near Eastern literature. It's like flood accounts, creation narratives, the names for God. Why should I trust the Bible when it seems that the Bible is just a product of these legends from the ancient Near East. Uh, well, you're right. The, the, the Bible and ancient Near Eastern literature are very similar. Uh, for example, God is called the rider on the clouds. He's called the Ancient of Days uh, in, in Ezekiel, I believe it is. Well, those are both divine titles for the god Baal, who we also read about in the Bible as a false god and as a false religion. But those are titles, divine titles for Baal in ancient Near Eastern literature. The flood account. Uh, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, you have a flood account with a guy named Utanapishti who builds a great, a, a big boat, and he is given uh, eternal life afterwards. Uh, you have uh, another story from Babylon. Um, I'm trying to remember the, the character's name. I, it, it escapes me now. Um, so you have these accounts. So what makes the Bible different? Um, well, let's first of all not be so naive to say that these accounts don't exist. They do. Th these accounts exist. And I would suggest that the similarities exist for a reason. So if you have three documents that give attestation to a flood, then chances are there was a global flood. Okay, because they all wrote about them. They might have written about them differently, but they all wrote about them. So there's something that we can take. Uh, the creation accounts, you know, from the ancient Near East, several people, uh, several nations have creation accounts. Well, that shows me that the world view of the time was that the world wasn't always existing, that it had to be created. Um, I would say, though, that if you're, if you're doing a serious study of these, rather than pay attention to the similarities, and you should pay attention to the similarities, but rather than pay attention to the similarities, pay attention to the differences. So, for example, in the flood narrative, um, the, the ark that's in the Babylonian text that we don't have in our Bible, the so-called ark, is a cube. The dimensions are a cube. Well, we know that a cube will not float. There have been scholars who have tested this. But in the Bible, the dimensions are of a rectangle. And sorry to burst the bubble of all you who have gone to the, the ark encounter, and I haven't been, I want to go, I think it's awesome, but the Ark Encounter prides itself on building the Ark to the dimensions that are given in the Bible, and that's kind of true. Um, it would not, they, they wouldn't have had the bowed sides uh, because, you know, you couldn't have bent wood very easily uh, during that time. So uh, I, I, would, I would just say that th the dimensions that are given in the Bible will float. All right, and the ones that are in uh, Gilgamesh and the other Babylonian epic, it won't float. So 
uh, understand the differences. Uh, in, in Genesis, the flood lasts for 40 days and 40 nights. In the Babylonian epic, the flood lasts for seven days. So you have a difference in numbers there. Um, so pay attention to the differences and which differences are more probable and fit with the context that we're dealing with. Uh, next question is a question about a Bible passage, about a Bible character, actually. Uh, Samson, was Samson a good or bad guy? And uh, you can read about Samson, Judges 13 through 16. Was Samson a good or bad guy? Uh, yes. So Samson is an interesting character because we, we have given him the status of hero in the Bible because uh, we see him pulling down the pillars uh, and, and kind of being the hero at the end of his life. But up until that point, Samson is a heathen. Uh, Samson has taken a vow. He's taken a Nazarite vow from God. He's, he's doing all of these great things. And then it just, it, it just all tumbles because he's not doing what God intended him to do. Samson, it seems to me that the author of Judges had this in mind, that Samson is a personification of Israel. Samson is supposed to belong to God, but he does what is right in his own eyes, which is a recurring theme, theme throughout the book of Judges. Um, he broke every aspect of the Nazarite vow, every single aspect. And so even at the end of his life, I don't think that Samson is a hero. I don't think that Samson is uh, redeemed by this one action. As a matter of fact, he brings down the pillars just so he can get revenge on those who put him there. He doesn't really do it for God. So I, I think that uh, there are three major ideas that need to be studied with Samson. Number one is that those who are chosen to be servants of God can and will mock God. Number two, God's plan will always be carried out regardless of the circumstances of the one chosen to do it. And number three, Samson seems to be a character who reflects the whole nation of Israel at this particular time. Good question, though. Next question. What should my response be to the media? Now, this is kind of a vague question because media can involve uh, the TV shows that we watch, movies. It can involve Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. It can involve the newspaper and magazines. You know, what form of media? I'm guessing this particular person is talking about news media. Um, but I think the answer goes with any kind of media. Too often, Ravi Zacharias said this, so I don't want to take credit for it, but too often we watch with our eyes and think with our feelings when we need to watch through our eyes and filter the substance through our mind. So one problem that a lot of people have today is that instead of saying that, uh, you know, I think so-and-so, we say, I feel so-and-so. Well, feelings are great, and God gave us feelings, but when we're getting information, we need to have a logical response to that information. So unfortunately, we have become slaves to our media, so you're asking what should our response be to the media. My response is click it, turn it off. Um, nowhere in law or religion are we commanded to watch anything that is produced. Uh, so I'm starting to believe that the Amish got one thing right, that uh, getting TV and computers and media and all that out is, is a good idea. Although I'm thankful for media because we can do this. Next question. How, sh how can I teach my children the truth when the world says that truth is relative? Um, well, I, I want to say, first of all, it's good that you see this problem because our world today does say that truth is relative. And what that means is that what's true for me may not be true for you, but I can't impose my truth on you. That objective truth doesn't exist and that relative truth is all that we have. So how do you teach your children absolute truth? First thing, start early. It is never too early to start teaching your children. Your children, their brains are developing the most from age zero to five. So get in there and, and get it done. I mean, people talk about wanting to um, read Bible stories from children's Bibles to their kids during that age. I say read to them straight out from the text. Uh, teach them Greek and Hebrew for crying out loud at that time. Uh, but get that embedded in their mind. People say, well, I don't want to brainwash my kid. Well, why not? You know, I do. If I had children, I would want to brainwash them because that what I'm brainwashing them with is true. All right, so train up a child in the way he should go. When he's older, he will not depart from it. So 
start early. Um, don't substitute church or Bible class for training at home. It is not the preacher's job, the youth minister's job, the elder's job, the Bible class teacher's job to raise your children. It's your job. Bible class and coming to church for learning, it's icing on the cake. It's sprinkles at best. What they get at home, that's the egg and the milk and the flour and the all the necessary ingredients that come together. And what they experience in the world is being put in the oven. When That's heat being applied. So they have to go through that, but you need to be there to give the essentials. And then when they come to church, it's just icing on the cake. Uh, I have one more thing to say about this. got to find my place. Teach your children to use logic and not feelings. So we mentioned that earlier with the media. Uh, teach your children to use logic and not feelings. Uh, feelings aren't wrong. Feelings aren't a bad thing. But our feelings need to be dictated by truth. And uh, logic is an, an element in the equation to wisdom. I, I've been quoted as saying that knowledge plus logic equals wisdom. And wisdom is the practice of using knowledge. So we need to train our children to think critically about things. Unfortunately, in our education systems today, critical thinking and critical thinking skills has gone out the window. Children are told what to think and why to think that way without much explanation, or they're told it doesn't matter, so you don't need to think. Uh, that We need to train our children to think and think critically. Uh, two more questions and, and we'll be done. Uh, next question, what did God do before creation? Oh, I, I love this question uh, b because it, it's taking it kind of a, a twist on a commonly asked question, which is um, how did God you know, how did God exist before creation? This is kind of a little more action. What did God do before creation? Well, first of all, I, I love the question. Thank you for the question. But the question is kind of asking the wrong question because it assumes that God is dictated by time. In order for God to be God, he has to exist outside of the things that are created. So if God created time, space, and matter, Genesis 1-1 says that he did in the beginning, time, God created uh, the heavens, space, and the earth, matter. So he has to exist outside of, of those three things. So God does exist outside of, of time. So you really can't ask what was he doing before creation because you're attributing time to God. Uh, so God exists outside of time, but he can insert himself into time. We see that when God uh, is, is having dealings with the Israelites and uh, with uh, you know the, the, the church even, he, he inserts himself into time. But to answer the question as best I can, we know three things about God, or two things, let me say. We know two things about God prior to creation. Number one is that he was there. He existed before creation. Um, I am, the name of God, Yahweh, a, a form of the verb I am in Hebrew, means always existent. So God never was created. Going back to our question earlier about ancient Near Eastern documents in the Old Testament, every single God in the ancient Near East was created. God was God of the Bible was not created. It was always existing. Um, so we know that. We know he was there. And number two, we know that he wasn't lonely because uh, in the beginning was the Word. We know the Word is Jesus. You have the Spirit hovering over the face of the waters. Uh, I would say that you have an angelic presence already. Um, we can't know that, but I would say that that's, probably, that that's probably right. So two things we can know. He existed before creation, and he wasn't lonely. Last question for tonight. Thank you all for uh, those of you who've watched the whole time. Uh, hopefully, again, I can get this uh, downloaded off here and onto, uh, onto YouTube for people to watch later. Last question. How can Jesus be God's only begotten son when Christians are called children of God in 1 John 3.10? So 1 John 3.10 says that we're either children of God or we're children of the devil. But John 3.16 says that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. So how, how does that work? How can we be children but Jesus is the only child? Um, well, this is a matter of translation and a matter of opinion, and I'll give mine. We can say he was the only begotten, or we can say he was the only unique or prestigious Son of God. And by way of illustration, I would go back to Genesis 22 and verse 2, where Abraham is offering Isaac, and Abraham says, uh, or God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son, your only son, your only begotten son, same phrase, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. Now, 
how many children did Abraham have? He says, here, take your son, your only son. But Abraham had Ishmael. And actually, if you continue reading Genesis, Abraham had, I believe in all, eight children. I have to go back and look at that, but I believe it's eight children uh, that we don't know anything about other than uh, Isaac and Ishmael. So when he says, take now your only son, what's he saying? What's it saying when God says uh, that this is my only begotten son? Uh, well, there are two words here. There's one word in Greek, which is used in John, and there's one word in Hebrew, which is used in Genesis. And I'm using Isaac as kind of a type for Jesus. Um, the Greek word is monogenes, and the Hebrew word is yakid. Um, both of these terms mean a unique and priceless possession that cannot be replaced. So when I am on stage, when I'm in the pulpit preaching, and I reference John 3, 16, and I do a lot, here's how I translate it. For God so loved the world that he gave his unique, one-of-a-kind son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I do that for this very reason, because 1 John 3.10 says that we're all children of God in Christ. So the, the significance of Jesus and Isaac, I think, is not placed on number. It's not that this is the only child of this particular being, be it God or Abraham or whatever, but that this is the significant one. This is the child of promise. This is the, the special child. This is the unique child. This is the child of Abraham and Sarah in his old age that cannot be replaced. This is the child of, of Mary who was born without an earthly father who is sinless, who cannot be replaced. So there's the emphasis. I hope that answers some of your questions. Well, I've had a great, great time preparing this and getting this together. I hope that you have as well. Thank you again to those of you who have stuck it out with me for 32 minutes, going on 33. And um, I hope to do this again live, in person, sometime. And uh, I'll have coffee there for you, Lord willing, and we can do this. Um, thank you again for all the questions. And I look forward to seeing you, Lord willing, the next time I see you. God bless you. I hope that you have a good night and uh, a great week for the rest of the week. We'll see you later.